Workplace psychological safety is the most pressing need we have today. But do you have the tools to transform a toxic workplace into a psychologically safe one? We have a course for that. It is called From Tormentor to Mentor, Building a Psychologically Safe Workplace. With this self-study three-hour online course, you can equip yourself and your organization to understand workplace bullying and harassment. More importantly, our course shows you how to build a foundation for a safe and healthy workplace using the SWELL principle, safety, well-being, encouragement, and learning. Elimination of bullying will only work if a foundation of psychological workplace safety has been intentionally built and maintained. Go to shiftworkplace.co slash tormentor to mentor to learn more. That's shiftworkplace.co slash tormentor to mentor. Perry Marshall is a marketing consultant and entrepreneur. In fact, he is one of the most expensive business strategists in the world, endorsed in Forbes and Inc. magazine. He has guided clients like FanDuel and Infusionsoft from startup to hundreds of millions of dollars. Perry Marshall founded the 10 million Evolution 2.0 prize with judges from Harvard, Oxford, and MIT. Launched at the Royal Society in London, it is the world's largest science research award. NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs uses his 80-20 curve as a productivity tool. His reinvention of the Pareto Principle is published in Harvard Business Review. His Google ad book laid the foundation for the 100 billion pay-per-click industry. And the ultimate guide to Google ads is the world's best-selling book on internet advertising. Marketing maverick Dan Kennedy says, if you don't know who Perry Marshall is, unforgivable. Perry's an honest man in a field rife with charlatans. I'm excited to interview Perry Marshall today on the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. I'm honored to be here, and we're going to have a fascinating conversation today. I'm really looking forward to this. We will. We will have a very fascinating conversation. So why don't we start a little bit about you giving us a bit of a personal take on who you are? Well, I am the engineer who got laid off from my job when my wife was three months pregnant, intending to come home and be a mom. So this threw me into a mad scramble, and I ended up switching into sales. And uh, my friend Frank said, you know, Perry, you don't just stick a pencil behind your ear and change careers like that. You know, this might be a little, I was like, oh, you know, those sales guys that come in to my engineering job, those guys aren't that smart. That, that, this shouldn't be that hard. That was the beginning of two years of bologna sandwiches and ramen soup. And did you know that baked potatoes and salsa is like a really cheap meal? Yeah, it's an um, awesome meal. Yeah, it works really, it works well for me too. <laughs> and and so, yeah, like spiraling credit card debt and pounding the phone and pounding the pavement and trying to go see people that did not want to see me. And that was really rough. And towards the end of that job, before I got fired, I stumbled into the world of direct marketing. This was in the late 90s when for a company to have a website was probably a little bit unusual. And I started to figure out that all of those things that the direct mail people were doing and the direct marketers kind of worked very well on the internet. And so, you know, maybe that's a way of saying who I am. So it has been quite the interesting adventure. So you started with the dot-com people in the very beginning. Yeah, except I was selling industrial equipment. So it wasn't dot-com. It was like way more boring than that, like automotive plants and steel mills and assembly lines and things like that. But, you know, we were selling hardware and software. And, well, we were a step ahead of most of the other industrial companies. And so the next job I took, we grew that company 20x, uh, I mean, the, the little part that they put me in charge of was just this little tiny sidebar product business, uh, but, but we grew it and, and sold the company for $18 million four years later, and I managed to get out with some stock options, and so I hung out my shingle, and that was 20 years ago. Yeah, well, that's definitely, I mean, you've, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting, so you definitely had a tasty pudding from all that, which you could 
share with other people. So let's go back a little bit into your childhood. Can you think of a couple of incidents that you believe made you into that person that you are today? Well, yeah, one one of them was uh, when I was about 13 years old, I got really interested in stereo equipment and I didn't have enough money to buy what I actually wanted. And so I ended up building some of it instead. And as soon as I got done with my first speaker project, the next thing that I wanted to do was another one because I only got to try one thing. It's like, well, let's try this a different way. And that forced me to turn it into a business because the only way that I could make another project was sell the one that I had just finished. And so I remember I was 14 years old and I put an ad in the paper and I sold a pair of speakers for $60. And a guy came over and wrote me a check and walked out with them under his arm. And well, that was the first dollar that I made as an entrepreneur. Well, you were thinking right from the beginning, I need to support the next piece by yes. getting payment for the one I just did. Mm-hmm. So you definitely mm-hmm. had an entrepreneur mindset. Well, and really, I think most real entrepreneurs would call that a technician mindset. It wasn't really about the business at all. It was about the hobby and everything like that. But see, I actually think that probably most people who start businesses are actually kind of like that. They are more like an artist than they are like some MBA or a business builder. And I don't think that most people properly recognize what that is and the place that it has. And eventually you figure out, well, you really have to do both. You have to build a business. You have to understand business. But I would say probably two thirds of my clients and students and people that I work with, they couldn't just do anything just because it makes money. They would only be interested in doing very specific things that are aligned with their interests. And that's actually fine. And if you're wired that way, you just need to work with it. Well, entrepreneur is artist, entrepreneur is technician, entrepreneur is operator, only if you take the initiative to sell it. And then from there, you start to build the rest and develop a vision around it. I don't think too many fortune-year-olds have a completely formulated entrepreneur vision. (laughs) No, I certainly did not. But I knew how to place a classified ad in the newspaper. I guess that was marketing 101 for me. Yeah. And if you didn't know, you would have gone and found out how and then gone and done it. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think the biggest thing about entrepreneurs is they're curious, you know, and I don't know whether entrepreneurs are curious or whether everybody else just isn't. (laughs) Maybe they're just curious about different things. That's probably a charitable way of looking at it. (laughs) Well, so that was when you were 12 to 14 years old. What about either earlier or later? Anything else that stands out as being formative for you? My dad died when I was a senior in high school. He died of cancer. And so that kind of kicked me out of the nest early. It, I mean, it didn't force me to literally leave home, but it forced me to be a lot more independent. And he had this plan that he was going to pay for his kid's college education, and that did not happen. And he was really heartbroken that he couldn't do that. It didn't particularly bother me, but I knew I had to hustle. So yeah, like between like the beginning of my senior year in high school and the beginning of my freshman year in college, my life had completely changed. And, you know, I know a lot of people that have had stories like that and they had to grow up fast, you know, and so I was doing things at age 20 that most of my friends weren't doing until they were 25. I got married at age 20. So You know, you go through stuff and it's hard, but then it ends up making you what you are. And then you look back on it, you're like, well, I guess I'm thankful for the things that made me what I am. Yeah, because out of the hardship comes character, unless it beats you into the ground. But the character emerged from having to grow up quickly. And so what if you didn't waste three or four years of your life partying? No regrets. No regrets about not doing that. And I didn't do any of that. It was straight to work. Straight to work, straight to getting married straight to moving on with being an adult. Indeed. So everybody's born into groups. You're born into a culture, a race, a time period. You have a gender. There's an age. There's ethnicity, language, religion. There's geography. Mountain people and ocean people and island people are not the same. So you were born into all these different groups. What would you say has influenced your sense of culture and self? I was born into a very conservative 
Christian culture in Lincoln, Nebraska. In fact, my dad worked for a ministry called Back to the Bible. And, you know, this is not a group of people that is highly celebrated in most parts of our modern culture. But I have to say, it was a really wonderful background, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And one of the things they valued was scholarly, rigorous learning. And, uh, you know, most people have never experienced a full-blown theological debate with somebody that actually knows what they're talking about. Of course, most people couldn't have one because they don't know what they're talking about. So they would kind of be excluded from the conversation. But, you know, I was taught Uh, It lists bits and pieces of Greek and Hebrew and ancient culture and history and theologians invented hyperlinks. It wasn't the World Wide Web. If if you become a scholar of the Bible, you'll find out there's this thing called an interlinear where you can look up any word and you find out every single place that it appears in the entire Torah. And then you, you learn this very deep context of things. And so, That was kind of what I was weaned on, and it did teach me to think. And so that's really been a part of my story all the way along. I mean, a lot of my kind of approaches to things have shifted in various ways, but I think that was priceless. This desire to go to the depth of something and to understand Mm. its origin, to have rigor in your research, to understand context, and to look at it from the basis of my faith will become greater if I know more, not less. Most yes. people don't have that. They think if they know more, they're going to have less faith. No, that's that's very, very, very not true. But you will wrestle with stuff. See, that's the thing. It's like... Yeah, it's it makes like you an you, independent investigator of truth. Yes, that's exactly Right. And only after you have wrestled with it, do you become an independent thinker. Yeah. And it's an ongoing process, which you continue to participate in. Yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been able to reach the heights that you've been able to reach in internet marketing. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. You get it. I hope so. (laughs) So that has really influenced you. And it's very interesting to hear you speak about it. What else? What other groups have influenced you? Well, there was the Amway Pink Kool-Aid phase. Wait, I'm thinking about the ones you were born into that you probably just, you became conscious of them over time. You didn't even know you were swimming in that water. I wasn't born into Amway, that's for sure. That's what I'm thinking. (laughs) Well, so you're looking for like a a different um, cultural background? Didn't you say Nebraska? Yes. Yeah. Cornhuskers. Okay, so what about Nebraska? What's the influence of Nebraska and the, and the area? Nebraska is very conservative, very modest, very egalitarian, very frugal. Uh, the number one grocery store in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I grew up, is called Super Saver. I remember one time they were selling twelve packs of Coke for two dollars. That was like a you know a, an incredible sale. I don't know how they scored that deal with Coca Cola. But yeah, like there's a little little bit of tall poppies syndrome there. You know, you don't raise your head too high above, but you know, like really good people and it's a, it's a good place to grow up and it's a good place to raise your kids. And, you know, to most people, it's just a flyover state. And most people don't think too much about Nebraskans. They, they figure they're probably unsophisticated hicks and farmers. In fact, okay, I got a great story for you. So I had this friend named Tosca. In fact, she is now a best-selling author. Her name is Tosca Lee, if you want to look her up. Okay. Uh, She's gorgeous. She was Mrs. Nebraska about 25 years ago. And her mother was American. Her father was Korean. So she's a mixed American Asian beauty and she was a dancer and she went to New York for a dance. And at the time it happened to be fashionable, at least in Nebraska, to walk around with no shoestrings, like no shoestring shoes. And so she's wearing these tennis shoes with no shoestrings. And somebody said, why don't you have any shoestrings? Now, Tosca's dad was one of the highest paid people in the state of Nebraska. He worked for the 
university and he did consulting on the side for three thousand dollars a day okay so like they were they were pretty well off the guy says why don't you have any shoestrings and she goes well my family can't afford shoestrings in fact my dad had to sell a cow just to send me uh to this uh, (laughs) and the guy believed her yeah he thought it was totally real so, you know, people think that Nebraskans, like you're from Alberta, so you can totally appreciate this. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> they, they, they think those people in the flyover states are provincial bumpkins. Well, you know, sometimes it's the big city people that are the provincial bumpkins. You know, they don't have any idea what's going on everywhere else because they don't think everywhere else matters. You know, I love that story. It's kind of like embrace the stereotype, you know? play along with it and see how far it's going to (laughs) go. I've never told that story on a podcast. Uh, I wonder how long it's been since she told the story. And so how does this tie in with you and your sense of self? Well, in the early 90s, I moved to Chicago. And boy, that was a change of atmosphere. So you go like Lincoln, Nebraska doesn't hardly even have a bad side of the tracks. I mean, there's a few neighborhoods that are like a little sketchy. And where there might be a little violence or something here and there, but not not really. You like you go to Chicago and it's the city of big shoulders, and then the Oprah show airs from Chicago, and you have the Gold Coast and the North Shore and you know, wealth and the Chicago Board of Trade, and you also have Cabrini Green and Inglewood and the worst, some of the worst neighborhoods in the country, and Gary, Indiana is only an hour away which is really a part of the Chicago area. And, you know, and you have poverty and racism. And so you have both extremes. But but what I found was the big city to be very invigorating. It was more my speed. So yeah, I appreciate where I came from. In fact, my wife is a farmer's daughter from Tecumseh, Nebraska. She went to a one-room school until she was in eighth grade. And so we've kind of had our feet in all of these different worlds. You know, Um, I I like that you spoke about that because the rural and the urban divide is huge all over the world. And if you can have a foot in both worlds, you can negotiate with people anywhere. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got a few friends that are billionaires. In fact, one or two of them I probably hear from every week. But so here's another story for you. So uh, this about, oh, eight years ago, I had two teenagers and they were developing an attitude. It goes like this. My latte's too foamy. (laughs) These are your teenagers? My teenagers, (laughs) yes. I had a 13-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl. And I was Mm -hmm. like, I know how to fix it. So I took him to Calcutta. And so we landed. And, uh, you know, a couple hours later, this lady named Smriti took us to the Caligat Temple where they do live animal sacrifices. And then we uh, left that, turned a corner, and we took a tour through the red light district. And so we're walking through the red light district in Calcutta, and it's me and this Indian lady and my two kids. And, you know, we're meeting all these people. Now, I don't know what an Indian prostitute looks like, but I guess, you know, people there do. So, like, we're, we're meeting all these people. And then um, we had a conversation with uh, this 13-year-old girl. And the lady made reference to her husband. And then later, the lady explained that the girl was married to a sugar daddy who's probably 40 years old. And then she explained how these women come from Bangladesh and they end up in Calcutta and they end up in the sex trade. And then like, you know, 10 years later, you know, one of the clients takes a look at the daughter and goes, you know, I think I want her instead of you. And then that's how the daughter ends up in the sex trade. And so we went back to the hotel that night and my daughter says to me, so dad, you know how you say half your battles were won for you before you were ever born? And I said, yeah. She said, I get it. Can we go home now? No, no. Because just knowing it isn't enough. You have to be there. You have to feel the pain. You have to connect with the people that are there and actually talk to them and have some kind of an association. It's so easy to just look at it from the outside and walk away and say, yeah, I've been transformed. 
Right. And I, I remember actually on a different trip, I was in Mozambique, which was at the time one of the poorest countries in the world. It's probably not that poor anymore, but you know, it's pretty bad. And uh, they had come out of a civil war and I was visiting this village and these people were doing all these things to, you know, build a better community. And I just had this epiphany and the epiphany was, you know, dropping food out of airplanes is not going to solve any of these problems. The only way to solve these problems is somebody has to leave their comfy suburban world and come and help somebody else. And they have to roll up their sleeves and live there. And I mean, they had a school and a feeding program and agricultural stuff. And I think they had an AIDS hospice and all this stuff. And it was like, somebody has to come and do this. Really? And how about the people there realizing their own destiny and asking for the help that they want when they want it? Well, instead of dropping in like a savior and imposing something that may not work. So my brother-in-law runs an organization called Children's Relief International. And their model is precisely to make sure that that does not happen because that is what usually happens. In fact, if you drive around Africa for more than, I don't know, two hours, you will eventually see some abandoned building that used to be the big American charity thing of where, you know, wherever you happen to be. And it's closed now and there's nobody there. What Alan did was he said, here's our model. We get behind people who are local, who are already doing it, and we help them do it. Yeah, that's a much better um, model. But I want to get back they, to you because it's really easy okay. to deflect away from you to all the other people you've met. And I'm that's really true. interested in you. So you, we're talking about groups that you were born into, and we're segueing into groups that you chose to belong to. So you chose to belong to groups that helped you to advance your business. You probably chose hobbies. You chose your wife and she chose you. So you probably chose to belong to those families then. I'm sure that there were some things that you adopted into the way you did things that became part of your leadership style. What would some of those things be? So I don't know where this is going to go, but a group that I got associated with actually helped form is called the Cancer and Evolution Symposium, which is a group of scientists who believe that we've largely gotten cancer wrong because we've gotten evolution wrong. And that if you want to understand cancer, you have to understand evolution. If you want to understand evolution, you have to understand cancer because they're almost the exact same thing. And so... That group got formed uh, within the last year, and then we're we're off to the races uh, with a bunch of activities, including a symposium that we did in October. And one of the things that I've seen happen with that group is that people, including myself, who were, you might call a man without a country or a woman without a country, suddenly had a country. What do you mean by that? Okay, you know, if you're a true maverick, you see the world different than almost everybody else. And if you insist on seeing the world as almost everybody else, there isn't really anybody who fully accepts you, or they may only grudgingly accept you. So, for example, I wrote a book called Evolution 2.0, came out in 2015, and basically I said, you know, the left and the right have both botched this thing beyond recognition. If you buy the typical evolution book in a typical bookstore, what it tells you is about 60% wrong, egregiously so. But then if you go on the creationist side where, you know, which is where I grew up, they've kind of got their own story and it has its own set of problems. And I was dissatisfied with both stories. And it was like in a polarized debate, I didn't belong to either of the polarizations. And so I just kind of had to make my own way. And what happened with the Cancer Evolution Group was that a bunch of people came together who end up seeing the world surprisingly similar ways. And now all of a sudden you had a a big enough group of people to actually do something. Kind of like a mastermind group in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. And, you know, and, and I think uh, mastermind groups were kind of new to them, but not new to me because I'm in the entrepreneur world and we do this all the time. And so I guess it's been really cool to see a mastermind group form in a industry that doesn't really do mastermind groups, not the way we do. 
So this became a group that you felt you belonged to. Yeah. However, I don't think this is a group that you joined and learned something different from. I'd say it's a group that reflected what you already were. Well, that's so true. What I'm looking except, for is anything, oh, okay. something you might have adopted. I'm going to give you an example. I married into a French Canadian family. I learned French. I spoke French to my children. We only spoke French at home. I had to adopt French. I had to learn the culture of France from his mother's side, the French Albertan culture, and the multicultural French culture, which exposed me to colonization in French-speaking African countries. And mm. it completely transformed me to have all those experiences because I saw the world differently. I didn't feel that I belonged necessarily to any of those groups, but I felt that I had insights where I could join in now and then that I would never have had if I hadn't gone through that process of learning the language and understanding those multiple aspects of Francophone culture around the world. What have you had in your life where you had to learn something from somebody else? Okay, so try this one. When I moved to Chicago, you know, I grew up in church. My dad was a minister. It was like, well, let's find a church. And I had heard about this, but you have to understand where I grew up, it was like super, super conservative. So came to Chicago and I heard about this church called Willow Creek, which was actually one of the biggest churches in the country. And in 15 years time, they'd gone from zero to 15,000 people showing up every weekend. And I heard wonderful things about them, and I heard horrible things about them. And so I decided to go. And so I went, showed up. It was actually Saturday night, and I watched everything that went on, and I thought, my goodness, they fixed it. They fixed church. It's not boring and irrelevant anymore. Like, this is fun. And that was like my first sex change operation. <laughs> And my mom was horrified. She's like, what? No, wait a second. And what they had uh, 10 years before, when it was just a bunch of high school kids, they would go around neighborhoods like Hoffman Estates, Illinois, and they would ring the doorbell. And when the person answered, they'd say, do you go to church? And if they said yes, they'd say, never mind, we don't need to talk to you. And if the person said no, they would say, we're taking a survey why not? And they would get all these reasons like, oh, you know, it's so alienating to have all those crosses and stuff, or I don't like the music or the sermon so boring. They took this whole list and they were like, well, let's reinvent this thing. And they totally reinvented it. And all of a sudden it was like this fun, really cool, interesting place to go where they spoke in plain English. And, you know, you didn't have to like have 12 people pushing the car to get it into third gear so that you could actually start. And it, it was revolutionary. In fact, it really revolutionized the whole Western church scene. So how did that affect you? It was my first major phase of re-sorting and re-evaluating everything that I thought I knew. It was like I had to find, uh, it was a totally new context and then I had to like sort all of these things out. And I have subsequently had to do that like three or four times. It, it was just the first trip. How old were you when you experienced that? 23. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I grew up on, on a certain grid and it was like, yep, yeah, new grid. Mm -hmm. And then like 10 years later, I went to a different church and that was like another sex change operation. So I've had two. I'd say that people every 10 years go through a shift in their lives. It typically affects their faith, their health, their wealth, their relationships, one or all of the above. It's, yeah. a, it's about a decade for most people, every mm. 10 years. So uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me that you said that. And so that was interesting. Let me <laughs> ask you a little bit about your temperament. So, you know, temperament is what you're born with. People will say, oh, yeah, he was like that when he was six months old, and he still is, right? And then there are things like personality, which are the result of you growing through the influences and the challenges of your life, which you've already mm -hmm. talked about. What would you say you were born with? What's like you from the get-go? A few characteristics. Born as the guy who wants to jump his bike on a ramp and be cantankerous and push the boundaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, born as an alchemist, 
mm-hmm. always trying to create something, always trying to break rules, um, always fighting the norms. But I am also ha- have a very deep appreciation for things that last a really long time. So like one of my favorite sayings is you should read something written before Gutenberg every day. Yeah, I love that in your book that you sent me, actually. That's just great. <laughs> before well, Gutenberg, well, that's super. Yeah, and, Well, he's the printing press guy. Why exactly. would you want to read stuff written before the printing press? Because it took a huge amount of labor to write it down and preserve it and copy it, which means it wasn't trivial. Like anything older than that, if it's still around, most of it, uh, if it's that old, is very, very important. And, you know, somebody hit it, wrote it on a scroll, hit it in a cave, you know, it, it survived the sacking of Rome and the burning of Alexandria, and it's still here. And I think it's the precise antidote to the shallowness and the trendiness of social media. I think we can all agree that social media has become a toxic pandemic of its own in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Well, what you were saying about pre-Gutenberg is that it stands the test of time. It's wisdom that has been passed on through the centuries and is as pertinent now as it was before. You could take something like Rumi, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, 13th century Persian poet who is writing things that when you read them now and you go, it's like he's speaking to me about my life right now today. So I really like that. And I think that's a great way to look at when people are having trouble establishing a morning routine or something like that. They need something wiser to reflect on than just their own thoughts and stuff that's just, you know, around in social media. They need to go back to deeper wisdom. So I think it is an antidote. It helps you to sort the grain from the chaff in social media. Mm -hmm. So you can do a better investigation of what is worth your time. If you have already based your reflection on things that were pre-Gutenberg. That's really lovely. I really like that. Did you make that one up yourself or did you get that from someone else? Um, I think that's mine, at least the way that I phrase it. You know, it's not mine is G.K. Chesterton said, news is old things happening to new people. That's true. I like that too. Okay, let me go to the question about any time when you were aware that your cultural understandings were specific to you and not normal. You did talk a little bit about that when you talked about bringing your kids to Calcutta and experiencing what it was like in the red light district and finding out about children who were sold into sex trade. My son wrote an opera about that actually, a huge hit. Really? So, yeah. What's it called? It's called The Redemption of Oksana G. That's written in four languages. And it's Ooh. riveting. It's the only modern music opera I've ever been to where I was at the edge of my seat and just in tears through the whole thing and cheering at the end. And I went, what was that five minutes? And it was two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was great. Wow. At any rate, yeah, so like that was one thing, which is I'm sure that affected all of you in the family. And that 13-year-old girl's life would have been normal to her, not normal to you. That would have been a shock moment. And Mozambique, you started to talk about. So a time that you felt really shaken because your sense of what was normal was no longer normal. So there's a story when I went to Kenya and I visited these people who ran a foster care program for AIDS orphans. So kids who'd lost both parents from AIDS, they would subsidize relatives who were willing to take them in but didn't have enough money to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a day and a half going around meeting all these AIDS orphans. And it was frankly kind of depressing. Mm -hmm. And at one point, something was kind of nagging me. And I said to the guy, I said, have you ever heard of microloans? And he goes, oh, yeah, we have those too. And I go, you do? He goes, yeah, you want to meet some of those people? I go, sure. So he drives me to this village and we go into a cobbler shop. And there's a cobbler named Paul who is crippled and he fixes shoes for a living. And so you got to appreciate the guy sitting on the floor fixing shoes with his crutches against the wall. And there's a line of people out the door getting their shoes fixed. And everybody I had met in the last day or so in Kenya. They were nice, they were polite, they were kind, they were hospitable, but they always looked worn out. They always had this 
sort of glassy kind of cloudy look in their eye like life is just wearing me down he did not have that look in his eye he had this clear like look you back in the eye you could tell like he didn't speak english and i didn't speak his language and i was talking to him through the interpreter but i could tell He's proud of his work. He's proud of his shop. He's proud of fixing shoes. His kids are going to school. They got uniforms. They got books. And I have like a flashback. And in the flashback, I'm at an Amway rally and we're in some coliseum somewhere with thousands of people and we're jumping up and down. We're excited and we're going to get rich. And then all of a sudden I'm like back in the cobbler shop in Kenya. And I thought, what was that about? Like, why did I have that flashback? And then it connected. And what it was, was, okay, so Perry, you know, you were in Amway and you were going to get rich and you're going to do all this stuff. And now you've left that behind. And this seems kind of silly, but hang on a second. Is it really so silly? Because you just met an entrepreneur, you know, a shoe repair guy. And he makes money and he serves people economically and he does something useful for the people around him. And that's why his kids have shoes and clothes and books for school. And you know what? All of the good stuff that everybody wants to do, like feeds AIDS orphans or, or build schools or governments or churches or anything, none of that happens unless there's an entrepreneur. And you just met the cornerstone of civilization is a guy fixing shoes. So, you know, your dad's a minister and that's, you know, an honorable profession. But Perry, what do you do for a living? And I thought, I'm a consultant to entrepreneurs. I help entrepreneurs build businesses. Well, guess what, Perry? What you do is just as important as anybody else, because if the entrepreneurs don't do what they're supposed to do. Nobody has anything. And that was in 2004. And I suddenly realized that my work really matters. Wow. That is a wonderful story. I love it. It's such a good way of showing two worlds colliding and giving extra meaning to both at the same time. That there's a commonality through the difference. That the clash brought you to what was the joiner. It's really great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I'd say that's the best answer I've gotten so far to that question. <laughs> well, thank you. I get some pretty darn good answers, but for that one, I'd say you win the prize. I wish I had a prize for you, but you probably don't need it. <laughs> a virtual gold star from uh, Alberta. I will declare you the Alberta gold star winner. Yes. <laughs> So where I'm coming to the end of the interview, I just have a few shorter questions to ask you about. And you've been such a good sport with everything, <laughs> including me challenging you on stuff. I wanted to ask you, you know, when people come to you because they want to purchase your services, they'd like to enter in some kind of an agreement with you, how would you explain the way you work best with them? What, you know, give a few insights into how to work best with Perry Marshall. Well, so this isn't something I do with everybody, but I'll tell it because it's very, very useful for some people to do. In fact, we just did this yesterday with a client, is a discovery contract. And a discovery contract is basically charging for a quote. Let's say you're a software company and you get a request for quote from some corporation somewhere. And let's say your software would typically cost $100,000. Well, you know, most people, they'll just say, oh, you need this, you need this, you need this. They talk to them on the phone for half an hour, and then they write it all up and they send it in. And what a discovery contract says is we don't do quotes, not for free anyway. If you want a quote, that'll cost $3,000, but you're really, really going to get something for your $3,000 because we're going to come in and we're going to figure out what your real problems are. And we're going to give you an analysis of your situation. and if you go with us, we'll give you a $3,000 credit towards whatever you do next. And if you don't go with us, the information you get from us will be way more valuable than you got from anybody else. And you'll be a much smarter shopper for whatever kind of software this is when you go spend your hundred grand. And that is a really good way 
of not getting clients that suck and not getting vendors that suck. Yeah. And what that also says is the way to work with you is that you see your worth and you see their worth and you want people who want to put some skin in the game and you want to get to the root problem. And if they want to get to the root problem, it's a good match. And if they don't, it's better that they work with someone else. That's exactly it. In your book, you started with the Beowulf saga where the monster was not who you needed to deal with. It was the mother of the monster. So That's absolutely right. You want people to deal with you and work with the mother of the monster. That's Otherwise, exactly right. you don't want to waste your time and you want them don't want them to waste theirs. Did I get that right? That's right. And it really weeds out the people that aren't serious. A lot of times people are just shopping around for a way to get their vendor to drop their price by $5,000 or something. That's not what I'm here to do. Mm-hmm. So. It's like people come to me for coaching and they go, you know, I'm just asking a question because uh, it's it's for my partner. And I'm going, mm, I don't think we need to talk that. <laughs> yeah. You yep. want to fix your partner's problem? Then why am I speaking to you? Because it's not going to happen. <laughs> I need a story like the Beowulf story for people like that. (laughs) So what would you like to say? This is your chance to, you know, get on your soapbox and promote yourself. What would you like people to remember about you or go to or get excited about? Well, you referred to the Beowulf story in my book, Detox, Declutter, Dominate. And uh, you were rather effusive about this book. And if you enjoyed what you heard, Go to Amazon and buy a book called Detox, Declutter, Dominate by Perry Marshall and Robert Scrobe. And it will give you the business philosophy that has guided me and will guide you. And one thing I'll say about this, you know, there is a million books that have like the seven secrets of fill in the blank. Well, this has seven things, but there's something very unusual about these seven things. Whether you're making $10,000 a year or $10 million a year, they're the same seven things. And I do not know any other book that can say that. And it's really nice if you can have one coherent philosophy for your entire career, instead of having to pick a different one every two years, because you outgrew the one that you were in. That's why I wrote this book, because I've had to outgrow a lot of things. And and I don't think the philosophy in this book is something I'm going to outgrow. I don't think you will either. I don't think anybody else will. I'm going to just do some user-generated content here and tell everybody how great it is. It starts with a fabulous story that really captures your imagination and that moves into the seven steps with riddles, guiding questions that make you just can't wait to turn to the next page. This is a business book. Most business books, you don't feel like you want to turn to the next page with great enthusiasm. (laughs) So uh, yeah, and then it gives you a framework that you can apply to your own situation, no matter where you are, what you do, which is pretty darn impressive. So yeah, it's a great book and uh, I recommend it to people too. So, and thank you for sharing that. Anything else you would like to add? Uh, Final words of wisdom? Well, I just appreciate this very thoughtful approach that you have. This is not a typical podcast interview. I've done a lot of canned, you know, but this is not that. So I really appreciate it. I also like your white hair. (laughs) Yeah, my kids have started calling me Silver Fox now. (laughs) Oh, it's awesome. It's perfect. It took you a long time to earn that hair. No kidding. No kidding. Sometimes young women come to me in the street, like less than 20, and they go, how do I get hair that color? And I go, (laughs) sweetheart, it's going to happen on its own. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just, just let nature do what nature's going to do. Yeah. It's good. Perry, it's really been a pleasure. And thank you so much for joining the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. Thank you, Marie. Have a wonderful day. You too. Perry Marshall has taken his talents and struggles to new heights of success by thinking big and scaling up in everything he does. From mathematical formulae to predicting upcoming tech trends and building charitable organizations, there are not too many future trends Perry Marshall is likely to miss. He is one of the best examples I know of go big or go home. I was honored to interview Perry and I'm enjoying following his writing and ideas. We can all benefit from checking out Perry's work. And a good place to start is always the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast show notes. I hope you will remember to rate our podcast. We are getting closer and closer to our listener goal of 10,000. And you can be proud to be part of the first early adopters community by rating our podcast. Thank you for listening. 
and make culture and leadership connections guide and inspire your day. This podcast would not be possible without the expertise of our Culture and Leadership Connections production team. A big thank you and shout out to Mike Kurlander for audio production and editing. To Malvika Kathpal for the show notes. Bernadette Guadiz for online web and social media management and promotions. Celine Bayogo for design. And Kirsten Hoyer for website and branding. Thank you so much. Hey, Culture and Leadership Connections podcast listeners. Do you love these insightful and moving interviews published twice monthly for your listening pleasure? You may not know that it costs between $300 and $500 per month to pay for our podcast episodes. Shocking, but true. Well, now you can help support this podcast by showing your love with a little skin in the game real money on the Patreon website. For as little as $5 or as much as $50 a month, you can contribute to keep culture and leadership connections alive and healthy. Your donation is invaluable in helping us connect the hearts and minds of people across cultures and professions for happier and more humane workplaces. I know you will call on your inner generosity, knowing that your contribution is a practical demonstration of love and support. Check out the patreon.com slash culture and leadership connections page to see what subscription level feels right for you and find out about the special loyalty perks at each patron level. That's spelled P A T. R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash culture and leadership connections. Thank you for your generosity.